I just want to welcome everybody who's joined over the last uh, 10, 15 minutes, because I've uh, seen quite a lot of people uh, joining the course. So I just want to apologize again to everyone. There were some issues with Eventbrite today, and I think that the link uh, for the meeting didn't get sent, uh, but you're here now. Uh, so we're very pleased to have you. Um, so we've got our three expert panelists here uh, talking about forensic science. So if you do have any questions, please post them in the chat. Um, we're really excited to have them, and then we can put them to, um, to our experts. Um, so, uh, yeah, any questions in the chat? Okay, so um, I'll have a look now at the next questions that we've got. Um, okay, so we've got a question about uh, if you're interested in a career in forensic science. Um, so uh, you have already touched on uh, your own careers. Um, and actually they're quite varied, uh, which is great. So I guess the question is really asking um, whether they're, um, what other routes there are into forensic science. So for example, forensic toxicology, um, how related they are. Um, and I guess, yeah, just what kind of relevant experience could you get to get into forensic science? I always think it's valuable for students to think more about doing a basic science degree, biochemistry, chemistry um, first, and then perhaps do a master's if you're really into forensics afterwards. The employment as a forensic scientist, uh, if you want a really good job in a, in a forensic laboratory, they would be expecting people to have master's degrees in forensic science. Uh, so um, I think a, a, a forensic undergraduate degree by itself is not going to be as helpful as having a broader view of science generally. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, there are, I mean, there are merits to doing forensic science undergraduate degrees versus pure science undergraduate degrees um, from the, the forensic service providers I've spoken to would tend to lean towards probably doing a, a pure science degree first and then specializing in forensic science at postgraduate level like Denise suggests um, and and yeah she's right that in most of the forensic labs will expect people to have master's level degrees um to get into their jobs so i spotted the question about forensic toxicology um and uh, a really good a good background for that would be like denise says something like biochemistry or chemistry um and then there are masters specializing in forensic toxicology as well um but you could so you could specialize in that later so a, a biochemistry degree would be a great preparation for a, a toxicology career or even pharmacology as well. Mm, yeah, good yeah. pharmacology. It's an excellent degree. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so we've got a question come in about whether you've ever looked at samples from really old sites, like ancient, ancient sites. So, for example, ancient DNA, ancient bones, um, and and what kind of information might be able to be gathered from that kind of study. We've looked at some ancient samples, ancient, ancient bones, ancient hairs, and sometimes we get absolutely nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing at all. So we've been looking at uh, um, pigtails uh, that are from the sort of 16th, 17th century, wow. and we can't get anything from them at all even though we're using the, the most sensitive mitochondrial techniques that there are available. So when you say you can't get anything, what exactly do you mean there? We can't get any mitochondrial DNA out at all. So is that because there it's degraded over time? It's degraded to such an extent. And when we use special techniques to, um, it's a home in on the particular bit of DNA that we're looking at, which is much more sensitive than the routine stuff. You have to be very aware that if you've got ancient material, a lot of it will be contaminated. 
it's very difficult to get rid of those contaminants, um, which are, you know, and the, they will, the DNA will have been exposed perhaps to bacteria in the soil, which breaks up the DNA. But we do have some success sometimes. Good. But yes, but it's generally um, very, even so, it's generally very degraded. What about ancient bones, Heather? Have you looked at any mummy skeletons or <laughs> such things? I wish I could say I have. Unfortunately, I've only had experience with relatively newish skeletons. And I mean that in the sense of the past couple of hundred years rather than quite old samples. So there's definitely been no recent skeletons I've looked at, unfortunately. But yeah, at the university, there are some lecturers that do kind of more research into ancient DNA analysis. So we do get to learn about that throughout the, our educational journey. And that is quite interesting. But as, as Denise says, it's, it's a difficult subject sometimes because it a whole of it a lot different depends on how the material itself has been almost preserved and how degraded the sample is and how the surrounding environment may have affected that sample. Because even a sample that's relatively new, depending on the environment it is, could be severely degraded where you might be to get little or no DNA at all. So it's it's a fascinating subject really because with forensic science there's so many factors which can affect everything it's really a difficult one really to get a solid result sometimes for whatever analysis that you're doing so um a few of you have mentioned uh, now about degradation of sample and the difficulty in extracting sample so i guess one thing that um would be interesting is what is the perfect conditions uh, so that we could get the DNA or the um, information from the samples from as long ago as possible? You hear of people digging up things from peat bogs, for example. Uh, is that is that why is that perfect? Why why does it seem to work so well? I, well, I guess you want samples to have not got too wet, not got too hot. Okay. Those are two things that are pretty damaging to DNA anyway. So dry and and cool and dark. I guess you don't want samples to be exposed to light too much because that will break DNA down as well. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so we've got a question come in. Uh, are there any advances in the near future that have uh, got your interest or got you excited? So um, whether that's developments, new techniques, uh, things that you uh, are excited about. Yeah, loads. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to pick the top one? <laughs> I mean, there are some there are some advancements in forensic DNA analysis that are not that far away now. Um, I mean, they're being done in specialist labs like Denise's, um, doing things like predicting v externally visible characteristics of individuals, estimating the age of somebody from their DNA sample. Um, there's kind of big advancements in genetic genealogy. Um, yeah, we're we're doing um, as Penny says, we you know we're doing all this age and phenotyping and uh, genealogy. We're using genetic genealogy, uh, particularly for um, sexual assaults on on women in the third world um, by aid workers. So they may be. Um, living with or having sex with aid workers and then a child is produced and the aid worker goes back to his country and uh, there are children who have who have rights of um, you know, where where they can apply to be I mean you know, if you if your father is British and you, you you just happen to be fathered by a British man then you do have nationality rights and we do quite a lot of work uh, using genetic genealogy for that purpose to uh, give people the rights to uh, come to the country which they're entitled to come to um, but also ethically 
uh, the genetic genealogy is a big problem. So although it has uh, taken off in a big way in the United States, uh, and you know, people are clearly very interested in it, uh, we don't think that it will be so useful here in the UK, even though lots of people are interested in it, just because we've got such a good DNA database. So the number of cases where it would be uh, useful is very, very few. Um, but there are a lot of unidentified remains where we do plan to be able to work on those. But um, ethics is a, is a big issue because you're not only investigating the uh, sort of genetics of the relationships, the particular things you found, there are all sorts of people, because we're using public databases, there are people who have not given their consent to give their DNA or have their DNA looked at, who are, um, who are identified because they are related to somebody who has. So it's a big issue. I'm going to come back to that point, um, but uh, just to round off, Heather, what is the exciting development that you are most uh, most looking forward to and eagerly reading about? <laughs> to be fair, there's quite a few developments, I think, across forensics, and I think all developments are always exciting because it's nice to move forward and help pinpoint and refine analysis to ensure that you get the best results possible and the most results possible. So I think it's all exciting, really. I think the thing that's piqued my interest most recently, as I mentioned previously, about how with skeletons, um, you can do biological profiles, so you can do people's sex, essentially, so their biological sex, it seems. But obviously, with nowadays, people are identifying as transgender, so that's becoming a rising situation in society. So it's how we apply that kind of new information to the biological profile of um, skeletal remains for example as we don't want to miss sex somebody uh, as they're presented but obviously sometimes the skeleton may present that a person is has male or male likewise features rather than what they present as female so the talk and the development about how we go about using this and also how we identify ancestry of human remains is also quite exciting I think as it's a right a step in the right direction really of understanding society more and taking into account people's individual choices and lifestyles and making sure that even after death they're respected in their wishes of how they've lived their life essentially so I think that's exciting for me. That's great. It's great to hear that uh, forensic science is still developing, even though uh, we cracked <laughs> DNA sequencing. There's still lots more exciting things on the horizon. It's fantastic to hear. Uh, so someone has asked, uh, I know we've, we've spoken already about uh, degradation of samples, which sounds like it's incredibly frustrating. Um, but somebody has asked, what's the most frustrating part of what you do? So uh, maybe except for when you're sample has degraded what's the most frustrating part <laughs> i think spending a whole week in a lab pipetting like crazy and taking utmost care and you're covered in body you know full body suits and you're working away and you're doing you know some of our sequencing is sort of eight hours on the trot and then it goes onto a machine which may take 48 hours to run. And then at the end, there's nothing there. Or it's, or it's complete, or you've put too much DNA there, or you haven't <laughs> put enough, or whatever. And you're, you've got nothing. So that's very frustrating. You've, you've worked so hard for a week. Yeah, of course. I think in the terms, it's mainly when I did lab work, I suppose, like Denise says, it's when you kind of put so much time and effort into something and it may be and something just hasn't gone wrong. Like at the moment, I'm doing a lot of forensic microbiology, so I'm working with bacteria. And sometimes if I don't seal my plates properly or so I leave them in the incubator a day too long for whatever reason, I just can't get back into the lab and take them out. And it kind of all falls to pieces a little bit. It's so annoying how just time gets away with you sometimes and just a few hours and something like that can affect results so much. 
So it's just the little, little, little DNAs of um, bacteria have just escaped from my plate. I'm like, oh no, I'll come back. <laughs> so that can be the most frustrating thing sometimes. It can't keep, can't keep the living things in one place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. Just the amount of time it takes to do stuff and things go wrong and things get contaminated no matter how hard you try. Um, yeah, it's just general molecular biology woes, really. <laughs> I can or definitely. When have, yeah. Or when you have a single hair in a tube, you open the tube up and the hair goes up in the, in the <laughs> air. You just lose it all together. I yes. think it's just there. It's gone. No, I was going to say we had that. We were analysing some beaver DNA samples earlier this year, as you do, and um, <laughs> we had some beaver tissue, and it was so dried and and light. We tried to cut it, and it just sprang <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> I just think it's so interesting that all of you are talking about the frustrations of the time and the effort and the long procedures. And it is just such a complete contrast uh, to the, the CSI and, and the TV programs where they go jing, 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 and there's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> it takes two minutes. I think um, it's and really... guilty. And he's guilty. Yeah, yeah and, and of course, you already know the answer. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, let's see what other questions have we got. Okay, so we've got a question about data collection. Um, so I think we've spoken quite a lot about what you do once you've got the sample um, and then you've many different techniques in, in the lab to try and get information from it. Um, is it the same people that are going out and collecting those samples? Are there specialists? Is it a certain person for this type of sample, that type of sample? Uh, how does that work? Uh, how does it work? Well, in a forensic service provider, it will be different people doing the scene examination from those doing the lab analysis. Um, so it samples would tend to be collected by crime scene investigators and then submitted to the lab and analysed by, if it's DNA, by a DNA analyst. Um, but occasionally specialists will go to the scene to advise on the kinds of samples that should be taken. Um, so things like a blood pattern um, analyst might go to the scene to look at blood patterns. Um, a biologist might go to advise on sampling. Um, in sexual assault type cases, samples would tend to be taken by a forensic medical examiner. Um, so it depends on the type of sample, really, and the context of the case. Um, but generally, it's different people taking samples than those analysing them. Great. It sounds like there's so many different people involved. It's not just a one forensic scientist that you might see <laughs> who comes and just uh, does everything. It's really no. interesting. No, it's not like on Silent Witness where they do everything from the pathology to the sample collection, sample analysis, interviewing suspects. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Although I do love Silent Witness, I should say. <laughs> this is the thing, is we all love these programmes. We <laughs> yes. question how realistic they are. <laughs> So um, mentioning uh, interviewing witnesses, um, another thing that um, I think is often shown, uh, and I wonder is how accurate it is, is um, you've spoken about going to court um, and giving like an expert testimony, but how about the police? Um, the, do the police have their own forensic scientists? Is it all outsourced? Um, is there a career to go into the police? Um, force as a forensic scientist how does that work from that point of view and some of the police forces do have their own forensic labs but the, um, it's only more recently that those laboratories are run only by the police are increasing because they have to have accreditation and forensic accreditation is really difficult for a laboratory to, to attain. I mean, it probably takes two years and a lot of money uh, for a, an organization to go through that process. So in, the, in, well, in England and Wales, there are commercial forensic providers. There are three main ones. And Scotland has its own uh, uh, provider, but they will tend to 
have conversations with the police, but not generally work for the police, unless you're working in a police laboratory. Metropolitan police have got their own laboratory and uh, some very skilled scientists there. But even so, they will tend to send off their DNA stuff, certainly, to one of the big forensic providers. And it's the same system in Scotland, Penny? Um, it's slightly different in Scotland. There's a single forensic service provider in Scotland, and it's still a public um, organisation rather than being private commercial organisations like it is in England and Wales now. Um, so the Scottish Police Authority Forensic Services provide all of the forensic services for the for Police Scotland, but they are not part of Police Scotland. They're part of the Scottish Police Authority, which is the organisation that oversees Police Scotland. Okay. So they kind of kept deliberately kept separate from the police, but obviously that, work closely with them. Sorry, sorry. It's okay. To touch on that as well, um, I'm not sure whether people may have seen on TV recently, but I believe on ITV Two or I mean BBC Two. Sorry, there was a CSI program, and that kind of followed the the kind of forensic science that's in police forces. I believe around the West Midlands kind of region, because I know it touched mm -hmm. upon. West Midlands Police and followed some of the CSIs there to real life cases that occurred and it followed them and showed them kind of collecting the evidence and then how the evidence went through kind of their departments because I know West Midlands Police they have their own crime scene investigators which go out and then take samples from the scene and they do their own fingerprint analysis and kind of CCTV analysis and neighbours and stuff like that so there are kind of programs on tv that explore the kind of the police aspect in more of a real life fashion rather than the media media shows that follow cr crime really so there are nice representations of and more realistic representations of how the police forces kind of interact with forensics and their forensic capabilities in terms of crimes and such as that great that sounds really interesting i'll definitely check that out uh, yeah, that sounds really good. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, okay, so um, we've got another question on DNA, um, which is that uh, if you took a sample, so for example, uh, a doorknob, but I guess any sample really, how uh, is it possible to differentiate between the DNA of different people? Um, how would you go about doing that? Denise? I can answer it. Um, yes, yeah, I mean, the most important thing is what you don't do is when you've got all these bits of DNA from loads of people, what you don't do is you have your suspects and you try and fit them into this mixture. That's really, um, really a problem and that you, you can end up with a very biased approach. But uh, there are mathematical solutions, mathematical and statistical solutions that can avoid that bias and help you um, look at the evidence that a particular person has contributed their DNA. The problem is that each individual component that you see, an individual component, may be present in between 15 and 40% of the population. But it's the combination of the totality that you see that you're confident has come from one person that gives the really strong evidence. Okay, so uh, I guess link into that uh, is this idea of getting the wrong person because you pick up the DNA and then when you look at the DNA sequence, um, you pick up a cousin or a brother or a, you know, relative so i guess i um would like to know how frequent that happens uh is there anything you can do to avoid against it and uh yeah is that something that you worry about i worry about it if they if they mention that uh well it might be my brother or it yeah um and then we would consider it and look at it mathematically to see how you know, obviously a, um, a brother is going to be more similar genetically. Uh, but, um, you know, so we will look at the evidence if they say it. But generally, we don't consider close relatives unless somebody uh, says something. But I did, ha did have a case 
which was interesting, where a uh, husband and wife had been accused of um, uh, fi a firearm offence. So the police had gone into their flat and uh, I think the, the man had chucked the firearm out of the window when they came in. So they found it in the garden and tested it. And, uh, and it was a really good match to him. And it was a really good match, it was a mixture, uh, a really good match to her and she was accused of it. But what they hadn't thought about was the fact that they had a young baby in the family and actually what they were picking up was the baby's DNA that had transferred there to the man and the mother hadn't, wasn't anything to do with it at all. So she didn't know about this firearm. Wow. Because, you know, the, the child will have uh, some of the DNA from the mother there. Yeah, they, they just hadn't, hadn't thought about that. So, yeah, I guess it is something to keep in mind. Um, has, do either, uh, Penny, do you have uh, any really interesting uh, cases that you may be, be, be sorry, maybe been involved in uh, that were similarly frozen? <laughs> Oh, I think it's me. I think you always need to have an open mind about what any about which is. Uh, we think it's one of the big problems facing, one of the big challenges facing forensic science at the moment, isn't it? The interpretation of complex mixtures. Um, yeah, I don't have much experience of using any of these new probabilistic genotyping softwares, but um, they do seem to be uh, very good at, at um, dealing with much larger numbers of, of contributors to a mixture. Yes, yes, they are good, I think. Okay, am I back now? Sorry about yes. that. I'm not sure <laughs> what happened uh, just then. I think it was me. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, that's the fun of virtual events. <laughs> so yes, I'm back now. Um, so I guess uh, the next question I have is we've talked a lot about DNA, um, but what other kinds of samples? Um, I think Penny mentioned blood patterning, um, I don't know if that's to do with DNA, uh, what kind of other information can you get apart from DNA uh, information from, I guess, a crime scene or, or a scene where you want to investigate? I mean, yeah, so blood pattern analysis is, is what it sounds like. So um, looking at the patterns that are made in blood at, at a crime scene after an incident and and determining various things about what might have happened um it's a not hugely there's not a huge scientific um evidence base underlying blood pattern analysis but there are certain things that you could tell about samples from the size and the shape of the the staining that you see um and that that would tend to be an, a blood pattern um, expert who would go to a crime scene and, and examine the, the evidence at the scene, obviously. Um, and then they might, they might take samples from that, but that would be for DNA analysis. Okay. I mean, anything can be evidence really, depending on what the, the context. Fair enough. Um, okay, let's see what else. Um, that one. Oh, I've seen the discussion in the chat about uh, the sex ratio in forensic science. <laughs> Females are very much in the majority in forensic science, quite oh, unusual as a science. Yeah, um, like us, our, like uh, Denise, our MSc courses tend to be. 90% female wow. and that's pretty well reflected in the in the in the people working in forensic labs in the UK at least um, and elsewhere I think yeah. that's so interesting yeah 
Okay, and just check, I think most of the questions that have come in we have now covered. Um, I'm just checking if there's something that I've missed. Okay, no, I think that is any, everything, unless uh, uh, our little uh, Scott site elves uh, working in the background uh, highlight anything new to me um so um we'll just give a couple more minutes in case anyone else watching has any other questions or something that i've missed please do type it again um i, I could definitely have missed it um so i guess um whilst we just wait to see if anyone else has uh, any questions um um oh okay we've got one um what kind of tests are done in forensic toxicology um and how long does it take so I guess, is that looking for uh, other substances that might be present, perhaps? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, so it would be looking at, usually at biological samples like blood, urine, um, and looking for um, substances within that, usually drugs, um, either legal or illegal. Um, and yeah, you would extract the chemical sample out of the biological sample and, and then analyze it using analytical chemistry methods, which I know absolutely nothing about. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I know nothing about it as well, but we do work, uh, we have a, a, um, a lab that does all the sports testing. Okay. And so we were involved in the, um, in the suspension of the Russian athletes in the, I think it's the Winter Olympics in Sochi, where the athletes were um, manipulating their urine samples. And um, so they got these bottles of urine and they have special locks on them. And they have managed to find a way of of, they're supposed to be tamper-proof. They've found a way of getting into them. And they would swap their presumably drug-contaminated urine with some fresh urine that they had collected themselves before they took the drugs to prove that they weren't taking the drugs. Uh, but you, you'd have to make things like the specific gravity the same uh, so that you know, it looked the same and they put salt into these things. So uh, our lab was analysing the amount of salt to see if it had been manipulated. And then we had to analyse the DNA in the urine. And quite often uh, what we would find is that because these athletes had collected their urine over a long time to substitute over time, uh, they, they'd run out of their own urine. They put somebody else's in a different DNA. Lovely. <laughs> or it might be a mixture or something. But anyway, it was, it, it was a very effective way at um, uh, stopping the Russians, uh, uh, banning them from the, um, from the Olympics. It's really fascinating. We actually had a Scott Sci event a couple of months ago. Uh, we had a um, sports doping science expert oh, yeah. uh, who came and spoke to us and we watched a, a movie which is available on Netflix. And I forget the name of it at this present moment, but they it was a whole uh, documentary about how that happened. And yeah, it was a crazy operation. Uh, almost had a little bit of respect for the dedicated lengths <laughs> that they were going to, but obviously, uh, you know, totally not in the spirit of the uh, Olympics or any sports for that matter. So that's, that's really interesting. So we, all, we also did a case where uh, the athlete had been, had been banned because of a, a substance. And it was found out that the, again, uh, somebody else's urine had been put there instead and yeah that was one of the people who who was presumably collecting the urine from the athletes so they have to be viewed you have to have a witness to peeing your sample um, <laughs> these witnesses can be paid sometimes amazing 
black market in uh, urine collection who'd have thought of it <laughs> it's something you don't normally value very much <laughs> okay fantastic so uh we haven't i don't no, we haven't had any uh, further questions uh, come in. Oh, thank you, uh, Paula. Yes, Icarus, that is the name of the documentary on Netflix. A very interesting documentary, uh, which talks all about, uh, yes, what Denise was just uh, speaking about um, and how it was when and they actually, um, they end up interviewing one of the scientists, the Russian scientist who was involved and his lab uh, was like the main operation where they were performing this uh, yeah, all of these swaps uh, with the urine. So yeah, definitely a, an interesting look and, and check out our um, our event on that. But I think um, with that Catherine, said, yes. Can I ask Heather a question? Would that yes, be of course, go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, I just wondered what you thought. Uh, there's been quite a bit of debate about um, body farms in the UK and um, a lot of people are in favour of it and a lot of people are very strongly against it and I just wondered what you thought. Uh, thank you Penny, thank you for asking. Um, yes, as you say, it's, it's got quite, it's quite debated, especially within the forensic science community within the UK, as there are um, forensic scientists that go either in favour for body farms in the UK or human farming facilities, what they're called, or those that strongly oppose it because they believe that animal uh, good enough, our animals are good enough analogues as humans, so we don't need to do actual research on humans to apply the findings to the wider public. I personally do support um, human body farms in the UK, or at least the possibility to have them in the UK, because I think they would be a good attribute to research that happens with the UK within the forensic um, science community. As we mentioned previously, about like samples degrading and how other various aspects can affect these samples, that's the same that happens to someone once they die. So the circumstances such as the geographical location and the climate conditions, whether they may be wearing clothes, whether, whatever they may be buried in once they're deceased, all these essentially affect how quickly the body starts to degrade. Once again, that key word, degradation. Mm. So all these factors affect how quickly someone starts to degrade and so this really affects with how we can determine how long someone has been dead essentially in the simplest terms obviously research on this has been done in America as I said in Canada in Australia and I believe there is also a similar body farm situation in the Netherlands but of course they have different geographical and climate conditions compared to the UK I think we're quite similar to with Netherlands a little bit if well the closest I suppose but it's not really applicable to take the findings that they have discovered and apply it to all the environmental conditions that we have here in the UK. Because if you look at, say, for example, Tennessee and that beautiful, glorious, hot, sunny weather, mm -hmm. we're probably lucky if we maybe get that once once a year here in the UK. And that's the day we all get our barbecues out and that's it, it's mm -hmm. done. But um, so, yeah, I think it's important that we can do research in the UK on donated human remains of people who have consented to do research on this once they have passed away and explore the same kind of circumstances that are being studied abroad so then we can see if the uh, circumstances and the results are the same and then we can apply these findings in real life conditions as the findings that are done in say America for example in those hot humid conditions might give us unreliable results in the UK and that might hinder successfully identi identifying someone or successfully convicting like a perpetrator if for example that person was sadly murdered or killed in a suspicious circumstance so I know I've rattled on just a little bit but it is quite a de debated a sense really because we don't really know without doing research within the UK if just doing research on animals is enough but of course there's ethical implications for both doing research on humans and research on animals so it is kind of a bit of debate really now, I don't think anyone is necessarily right or wrong in their view as it's how it affects their research but I do it's a very good and interesting topic I think <laughs> it is an interesting debate yeah thank you but actually just speaking then reminded me that uh, Denise you mentioned this earlier about the idea of ethics uh, so Heather yeah you obviously mentioned in there about the ethics of whether we should be doing research on animals, on humans, the benefit, uh, you know, um, that needs to be weighed up against that. But I guess the other um, 
the other ethical aspect uh, to forensics is people who are still living um, who may have had their DNA sequenced um, and so you may be able to identify them so um, what what are the rules around that and, and how does it work if you find uh, a DNA match do you have access to you know the like 23andMe and those kind of databases um, what, what are the rules around that? I mean, so potentially it's a, a real problem. I mean, there, you know, there is the argument with databases like uh, 23andMe and uh, Ancestry. You know, some of the providers uh, will not allow a law enforcement search. So it's just, it's only allowed for uh, recreational genealogy. But even so, um, I think lots of people who go in for this don't understand that it not only affects you finding your second cousin twice removed or whatever, uh, you may find all sorts of things which you didn't know about before, but it also impacts on people who haven't given their consent to that recreational stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think also uh, people don't understand that even though, you know, as scientists, if we're working on DNA, in that sort of area, we anonymize our samples. So we're working on, uh, in research on anonymized samples. So we don't, we can't trace back and say anything about the, the people. Uh, but uh, 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 an associate of mine uh, did some research on uh, DNA that had been given anonymously to a biobank to see if that person could be identified, and they could. Uh, it didn't take long to actually identify who that person was. Um, so, we, you know, that it wouldn't always be the case, but you know, that's a risk that is taken by people who do put their DNA up there. Um, and I think people aren't fully aware of the risks that they're taking when they do that. Mm. But we're, we're very aware of, I mean, I'm on a, a home office uh, ethics group, and it's something, you know, we consider all these things, whether the home office take any notice of us, of course, is another matter, but, um, but, but you know, we have a lot of scientists and ethicists on our group who consider all these uh, new things that the police are doing, like, facial recognition and uh, you know, so we, we will look at the science and we will look at the ethical aspects and advise the home office on what we think. Fantastic. Okay. There are, there's, sorry. No go. Oh, I was going to say there's there are also ethics around everything that's stored on the DNA database in the UK um, and the, the law has changed around that um, in the last 10 years um, so it used to be the case that you could keep DNA profiles pretty much indefinitely for anyone who'd been arrested for anything but fairly minor offences um, but after various cases and um, rulings by the European Court of Human Rights it's now much more restrictive in England and Wales. It was always much more restrictive in Scotland, um, but the law is now very similar across the UK. Um, so if somebody is um, arrested but not charged or charged but not convicted, um, then their DNA profile has to be deleted from the database, or at least it's supposed to be. And the good thing in, in the UK is that these databases are held very securely mm -hmm. and by independent people, whereas in lots of countries, the database is held by the police. And then there is potentially the opportunity for um, manipulation in some way. Yeah, the access to the, yeah, access to the UK database is very highly restricted. There's only a handful of people are allowed to access it. Well, I think that's reassuring, at least for people in this country. Okay, I think uh, we will draw to a close at this point. Uh, so I just want to say thank you so much to all of our panelists. 
I've definitely learned a lot and really enjoyed hearing from all three of you uh, about your experiences. I hope everyone uh, in the audience uh, feels similarly uh, um, educated around the world of forensic science. Um, and so, yeah, uh, this event was run by Scott Sai, and uh, you can check out more of our events uh, in the future. We're always uh, open to suggestions of events that you might want to hear about. All of our events are free and open to the public, uh, so you can get in touch with us. You can follow us on social media. And you can also follow all three of our panelists on Twitter if you're interested in their research. Uh, so if you go into the Scottside Twitter page, uh, we've tagged all three of you guys uh, on there so you can follow the developments uh, that are going on. So uh, with that, uh, I'll just say thank you very much to everyone for coming and thank you again to our fantastic panelists. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night. Bye. -bye.